Hello, I'm Katie Jarvis. This week, Real Foot Forward is made possible by our friends at CrossFit Auto Body, located in Union City. CrossFit Auto Body is the perfect place to begin your fitness journey. Come in and become part of the CrossFit community. Visit uccrossfitautobody.com for more information. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Scott Williams, and we have a really special episode of Real Foot Forward today. We're at the Tennessee Farm Bureau Annual Meeting. We're going to talk with farmers and others working in agriculture who are here today. Okay, so I'm here with Keith. Keith, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you do? I'm Keith Harrison. I work uh, for the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. I'm the assistant commissioner over the business development area there at the department. So what does the Tennessee Department of Agriculture actually do? Well, that's a good question. Uh, (laughs) About half of the resources and the programs that we have evolve around the forestry industry of the state. And then uh, a good portion of of our programs evolve around on the regulatory side consumer protection, that kind of thing when it comes to food safety, animal safety, plant safety, weights and measures, fuel quality. And then we have a a good amount of resources devoted devoted towards industry development, uh, trying our best to improve the economy in the state of Tennessee through various programs like the Tennessee Agricultural Enhancement Program and the Ag Enterprise Fund. We try to help market products domestically and internationally. Because agriculture is a big part of uh, Tennessee's economy. Absolutely. Uh, It's the top industry in our state's economy. It's something that's common in every county in the state of Tennessee. And uh, something that's, uh, you know, of course, the first uh, department that was formed in state government was the Department of Agriculture back in 1854. Oh, see, there you go. uh, So it's pretty important. Yeah, absolutely. So let's talk about you and your path. Where did you come from? Um, I'm originally from Wilson County, right outside of Nashville. I went to school at the University of Tennessee and got a degree in uh, agricultural business. So you knew right, you knew pretty early that you loved the agriculture business. Absolutely. Did you grow up on a farm? Being raised on a beef cattle and tobacco farm, I knew that's what I wanted to do and was heavily involved in the FFA and uh, knew that's what I wanted to do and took that path. And uh, it's led me to now, it's been 35 years that I've been blessed with a career in agriculture. Now, what other, uh, for, you know, there's probably folks out there listening who might be thinking about they might want to work in agriculture. You're, are you actually a farmer as well, or are you just working the other areas of the I business? continue to farm. Um, you know, I, I farm about 400 acres and have about 90 mama cows on the east side of Wilson County where, on the home, home farm. I'm involved with my both my sons uh, help me on the farm and uh, my father who's 89 years old and we hold it all together. Well, you got a multiple generations working on one farm. Absolutely. So what other what other I know you've worked in some other areas of agriculture as well. What else have you done? Um, I worked uh, when I first got out of college. I worked for the Department of Agriculture for 16 years and then I I, I bolted off to the uh, private sector and I worked for 16 years for Tennessee Farmers Cooperative in Laverne. And uh, I was when I left there, I was the marketing communications manager for the uh, co-op system. So you uh, have been in agriculture for a long time. What kind of uh, changes are you seeing in the industry from when you first began to what's going on today in agriculture? When I look at, I graduated in, in 84 uh, and from college. And, you know, in the 80s, agriculture was not in that good a shape. Uh, but it's just been amazing to see the opportunities that young people have had over the years to come back and to farm or to be involved in agribusiness or food processing. Uh, There's just so many more opportunities today than there were whenever I graduated in in the mid-80s. What, what, elaborate on that a little bit. What what shape was it in for people who, uh, honestly, a lot of people don't know anything about agriculture? Well, that's a good question. You know, the the 70s uh, and and then on into the 80s, you know, we had various embargoes, things that were going on that really uh, were were kind of difficult on row crop producers and others, and uh, we were kind of coming out of that. And uh, so I'm guessing a lot of people went out of business during that time. There so. was it was tough. Uh, interest rates were very high, mm-hmm. and uh, farmers couldn't afford to stay in business. And uh, but it's just it's it's been great to see the evolution. You know, the things that we're doing now that we didn't do back then. You know, for instance, agritourism. You know, folks coming out to a farm and uh, going and picking out a pumpkin or picking strawberries or picking out a Christmas tree, uh, enjoying the experience of the farm, that kind of thing. Uh, it's been great to see uh, 
you know, the, the value added food product industry grow and prosper in the state, uh, things that we can grow and then also add value to by processing. And it's just a different day today. Um, what, uh, what do you think the future holds for agriculture? What, if, if, let's, let's say it this way. If I'm a junior in high school mm-hmm. and I'm thinking that I would like to consider careers in agriculture, what areas do you think are growing? What opportunities do you think exist for me as a, as a young boy or girl in high school? You know, it's kind of interesting. Um, when I was at school at Tennessee, um, food processing, food science, if you would, was an extremely hot thing to be majoring in. It continues to be like that today because ways that we can add value, that we can process. You know, of course, I graduated college before we ever had buffalo chicken wings. Remember? I mean, <laughs> yeah. but those came out yeah. in the 90s, plus yeah. or minus. Okay. Yeah. All right, you just think about that. In, in, you know, in the 80s, we, we didn't know what we were going to do with our chicken wings. And so we had a little hot sauce to them now. And now <laughs> that chicken wing is one of the most valuable parts of that, that bird's carcass. Hey, somewhere I was reading how many chicken wings America consumes during the Super Bowl, and it's just an astronomical number. It's unbelievable. But think back in the Super Bowls in the 80s, we didn't eat chicken wings. Yeah, that's true. We just ate pizza or whatever, you know. <laughs> but, I mean, it's things like that. And I go back to that. Ways that we can take that raw commodity add value to it, change it a little bit. It's just amazing. Yeah, how how did that happen? How, how did we go from no chicken wings to billions of tons of chicken wings? How, that, Somebody had a good idea. Is that what happened? I you mean, think? That, that's, just, just, that's just, you know, it, somebody had an idea. Did it truly grow organically, or yes, did yeah. somebody say, hey, you know what, we ought to try to... I think it grew organically. I think somebody had a good idea. That's I think fascinating. They, Someone I think should write that, a book about that. Well, they should. They should. You know, I wish I'd have had that idea. And if patented, did, <laughs> I could have made a lot of money, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And there's even restaurants now where that's, a you know, one of their biggest items that are on the menu. Yes, sir. Um, so what, uh, STEM is big. We do a lot of STEM work at uh, Discovery Park. So there's a lot of uh, science in agriculture. So there are just all kinds of, uh, what, what, what would you suggest uh, if I were a young person? How can I find out? more about the careers in agriculture and you know it's kind of interesting it hadn't changed from the time that i was in high school in the 80s i got involved in the future farmers of america the ffa Uh, you have opportunities to get involved in 4-h you can find out through being part of those organizations the opportunities there are by competing in competitions Uh, you know you go and you have chances to visit various schools that you can major in agriculture and learn more about them things haven't changed at all it's the same process and you've got you've got Two sons, you said? I have two sons. And they're following in your footsteps? Both of my sons uh, majored in the same thing that I did, uh, ag business at the University of Tennessee. Uh, Both of my sons were in the same college fraternity that I was in, the Alpha Gamma Rho fraternity, which is the ag majors fraternity. Both of them, uh, uh, one of them works for Farm Credit to Mid-America, and the other one is an appraiser in Wilson County and farms with me. Both of them farm with me. Fantastic. And see, there's a lot of opportunities that don't necessarily just have to do with farming. There's all kinds of fields in the agriculture business. Yes, sir. Well, so thank you for being here today. This oh, has really pleasure. been this has really been fun. We're just exploring all the different areas of agriculture. Well, I appreciate the Discovery Park. You guys have got a class operation up there. Uh, I, I visited a time or two. Oh, good. And, um, you know, very much looking forward to seeing even bigger things in the future as you guys move forward. Absolutely. Well, thanks a lot. No problem. So I have with me Carol. Welcome, Carol. Tell, Hello. Tell me a little bit about yourself. I'm a... Uh, Assistant Commissioner for Policy and Legislation with the Tennessee Department of Agriculture. I've been involved in agriculture all my life. was raised on a registered Hereford cattle farm oh, in wow. Middle Tennessee. Okay. Two older brothers, younger sister, and I all graduated in animal science from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville. Wow, you guys are an ag family. Yeah, that's right. And so I've been involved in all agriculture all my life. It's kind of a passion. So what, what have you seen, what changes have you seen since you began your career in agriculture or maybe even since you were uh, growing up to well, today? Well, as I said, I've been involved in agriculture all my life, so there's been a lot of changes. Just uh, technology probably pops out in front of everything else. But uh, and do, you, do you personally still farm? Do you? We, we still have a family farm in Macon okay. County, and my brother has recently, one of my brothers has recently moved back there okay. and is uh, got Hereford cattle back on the farm, so we're very thrilled. He's remodeled our family home, and so he's he and his wife's living there. My oldest brother's a veterinarian and has Hereford cattle in East Tennessee. 
So see, you, you've really, you're entrenched in also not just the business of agriculture, but also the lifestyle of agriculture. The lifestyle, and it's agriculture, Tennessee agriculture is kind of a family. You know, you see people all across the state that you have some connection with when it comes to agriculture. Come to Farm Bureau meetings, and you see people here that you've been friends with all your life. And uh, I was involved with Farm Bureau Young Farmers, and it used to be called Homemakers oh. before it was Young Farmers and Ranchers in Tennessee. Yeah. And so got really involved in a lot of uh, activities then and got to know a lot of people across the state and still best friends with them today. So. And so what in your job, what kind of things do you do in the policy arena for Tennessee Ag? I am the liaison for the department between the department and the General Assembly. So I work with all 132 Tennessee state legislators, senators and representatives, get to know them and their staff. Anytime they have a question or concern about Tennessee or about agriculture in general, then hopefully our relationship's strong enough. They know to call me and contact me and try to work something out before they try to file legislation to make some changes that might be uh, harmful to our ag community. So I track all agriculture-related bills and anything that impacts Tennessee agriculture and our Tennessee Department of Agriculture. That's a big job. It, and it, it's about it's right around the corner. We'll start in a few weeks, second yeah. second Tuesday in January. And so, what is there any big changes on the horizon that you can talk about? Well, there's always hemp changes. We've got hemp. Oh, I'm fascinated by hemp. Hemp, hemp is a big topic right now. We've got some other issues that I probably won't bring up right now. But there are some other things coming down the pike. Okay. Uh, but yeah, there's, it's going to be a big, big year in the. Let's Tennessee. talk about hemp for a minute. So, yes. so hemp. You know, a lot of people who are listening don't know anything about uh, uh, hemp or other than what, you know, the, the perception of hemp mm-hmm. as being marijuana. Um, but, but it's in, but, but it's in, not. It's not, right. It's there's, not. A, there's a two different uh, types of product or multiple types of product. The hemp that you and I are talking about now, you could smoke all day long and it wouldn't get you right, hot because right. it doesn't have the right levels of... THC. THC. Mm-hmm. So... You know, there's a lot of farmers who um, are excited about the opportunities of growing hemp. Um, what are the challenges that you're seeing in legislation uh, relating to, let's just say I wanted to start a hemp farm. Okay. What, what um, from the legislative side, what, well, what, what are you seeing? I guess let me start first. First off, if you wanted to grow a hemp crop, it's very. Uh, we encourage anyone who is, contacts us and is interested to have a a business plan. Have a plan. If you don't have a market a, a plan of what what you will do with that final crop when it's when it's ready to harvest, then you know you're going to be with a loss of not going to have the income coming in to cover your expenses. It's time. It's it's. Labor is time sensitive. It takes a lot of time. Uh, it's like tobacco, hard work to get out there. And, and right now, there's no uh, chemicals approved to spray on hemp crop. So it's it's basically uh, managing your weeds by hand or or in a greenhouse. And it's just very labor intensive right now. And I've heard I've I've just been doing a little bit of research on it, and I, I've heard that some people are saying we're in a bubble. You know, where everybody is excited about mm-hmm. running in and growing it, and yes. that the bubble is soon going to get to the point to where people realize how much work goes into it. And people realize we're not as far along in hemp as we are the other row crops right. because we haven't had decades and decades and decades right. of innovation. There's not a given market at the end. Right. So you, have to, you have to find that. Uh, we are trying to work with processors and trying to help fill that gap, but uh, federal uh, rules came out a few weeks ago that is uh, not set in stone yet, but is is kind of a draft set of rules, and with that, we will have to change the way we have it set up in Tennessee under state law, Mm -hmm. Uh, so potential we may have to make some statutory changes, so we're looking into that right now. It's a gold rush feeling right now, mm-hmm. and so legislation is probably trying to keep up with the, right. you know, the panic of people trying to jump into the business yes. 
um, without having all those things. Yes. And, and, yes. and what damages the whole industry, I'm guessing, I'm not in the hemp business, but I'm guessing failure is going to damage, it's going to give a black eye to the entire um, industry. Exactly. And we, we, won't, we don't want our farmers to be, uh, you know, looked upon in a negative way right. or, or have failure or loss of income. We want our farmers to be able to grow and prosper and, and continue. Uh, our Tennessee agriculture is number one industry in the state, mm-hmm. and we certainly want that to continue. And so we'll hit, we're working with our farmers and our producers in any way that we can to keep that going. Well, thank you for the work you're doing. I know especially for people who are trying to get into hemp, but for everybody, I know that you're doing, doing a great job, so thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Hope Ellis Ashburn. That's a great name for an author, of which you are. Yes, it's very exciting. So we're going to talk about your book, um, but first of all, let's back up to the beginning of you. Where did you come from? I grew up in Bledsoe County in southeast Tennessee. Okay, Pikeville fantastic. Pikeville is the county seat. In a, on, an, on a farm? On a farm. I was raised on a 332-acre dairy farm. Okay. Oh, wow. That's, yeah. That's a, that's a lot, of, uh, lot of dairy. It'll be interesting for us to talk a little bit about dairy because sure. I know that it's that whole business is changing and evolving. Sure. And one of the things I always try to do when I'm out doing my book sign as I have a lot of dairy literature and try to do a, some dairy promotion. So tell us, a little, tell us a little bit about the whole dairy business. What, Obviously, the changes, what, what, for a lot of folks that listen to our podcast, we're not an agriculture podcast, so a lot of people aren't, aren't into agriculture necessarily. So tell us a little bit about the dairy business. Well, um, certainly nowadays, the landscape has changed quite a bit from when I was growing up on a dairy farm in, in Bledsoe County at the time, you know, it was a... A thriving, you know, industry, and then today, in the entire state of Tennessee, you can almost list the dairies by memory. Um, there are so few, which is one of the reasons, like I said, that uh, I try to promote it every chance I get. Um, gentleman that I was just talking to inside um, said that he was worried when his family got out of the dairy that he wouldn't know how to do anything else, but then he realized that he was really equipped for anything and everything because of his experiences mm-hmm. on a dairy farm. And so why is there a decline in dairy farms in the last? Well, uh, just recently, I mean, milk prices um, are certainly a big part of that. There are other moving parts and pieces um, to that, too, um, obviously. But um, with uh, the name of the food company just escapes me right at the moment. But there was um, recently... uh, a bankruptcy, you know, involved and dairy farmers getting paid for their product. And, yeah. um, it's, it's truly a hardship. You grew up on the farm. Yes. You, did you leave the farm and, and go out into the big, well, big um, bad world? S- sort of. I um, actually have two degrees in agriculture. I have a degree in animal science with an emphasis in horse science and um, a master's degree in agricultural education. And so for the first few years out of college, um, I was an extension agent for okay. about five years. And, and uh, what is an extension agent? Um, well, I worked for the um, extension now is um, a part of the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, and then also Tennessee State uh, University. Uh, but I actually worked for UTK. I was uh, stationed in Roan County, and I was a 4-H agent, which meant that I worked in, with youth in agricultural programs. At the time, they were separated out into agricultural and family and consumer sciences, and I was an ag-based um, agent. So I worked with them and their um, ag projects, horses, beef, dairy, sheep, goats, oh, just wow. the rabbits even the whole um everything from small to to large animals so um that was a part of my responsibilities there so um you were doing a lot of uh, you combined a lot of different uh yes worlds teaching yes. and what inspired you to shift to becoming an author well um i actually have wear a lot of hats i'm a full-time school teacher oh, wow. and then um i write part-time i do freelance writing on the side for some horse publications horse illustrated and equus um, are two of my clients, U.S. Equestrian, Sideline, Hoof Beats, The Horse. Um, I've got a, about seven or eight clients that I write um, regularly for, Arabian Horse Life. And, and I also belong to this amazing organization called the American Horse Publications. And so, so you started off on a dairy farm. Started off on a dairy. But and you've evolved. I've evolved. And then now my husband and I um, actually have a beef Farm. Oh. We, we have an Angus cow calf beef operation. So. Oh my goodness! So yeah, um, I wear a lot of a uh, lot of different hats. You are busy teaching, riding, farming, you name it. So. What made somebody who's got all that going on decide they wanted to write a book? Um, 
again, I've had a lot of friends. This is actually my second book. Um, I wrote the first book um, just on a whim. I had a, um, and it actually worked out pretty well. The horse that I talk about in the book that I won in a contest when I was 16, um, he came from this amazing Arabian horse breeding program in Middle Tennessee. So you won this horse in like a contest of some Yeah, I wrote kind, an or? essay and oh, won him as 4-H contest and I wrote okay. an essay, won this horse. And at what age were 16. you? 16. 16, okay. And I got, I had a horse before that, but I've always liked to jump. I love riding English and jumping, which was a little bit of an oddity where I grew up, where everybody had Tennessee walking and racking horses, which are great. And I, I had one of my own. I had a racking uh, pony, but okay. I wanted to jump. And so I entered this. There was no way my family could afford a horse that could jump. So I had to get creative. And uh, I entered this contest and won this horse. And, and so uh, you wrote, it went away. And then how did you find out you won? Well, um, actually, I, I won him that same year. I wrote the essay that summer. I went to pick him up and won him in the contest. And I met his breeders. And um, they actually invited me to come work for them when I was 18, when I graduated from high school. And it was just a fabulous experience. So I wrote about this very niche Arabian horse breeding program that is actually part of the uh, Mars, the Milky Way Farm okay. estate in Giles County uh, in Middle Tennessee, which is a part of, used to be a part of the Mars candy, um, okay. candy kingdom would be a good way to put that. But okay. it was... Um, it, he was. He changed the horse. Changed my life. Uh, gonna change the. He was a game changer for me. And so, uh, I mean, I'm assuming that this was a very uh, expensive horse. He that, was an Arabian did, horse. Did you he guys was, have like the uh, type of uh, stall? Oh that, gosh, no, no. Um, so he was in my backyard um, in an electric fence in my backyard in a converted chicken coop for a stall. <laughs> and so, um, and he wasn't trained, and he was 11 years old, and and I was young and dumb, and. Um, you know, didn't, you know, yes, I had horse experiences, but I guess didn't put together that um, probably wasn't the, the best match in the world, but I trained him to jump five foot fences and we jumped irrigation pipes and we rode ferries across the river and he was, he was just my heart horse. He was I mean, you must have become kind of famous in your community for having won this incredible horse. Well, everybody knew about um, Hope and, and the gray horse that, uh, the gray Arabian, because that was a very unusual breed. Oh, they beautiful at the time. too. Yes. I can just yes. imagine how pretty it was. Yes. And there probably weren't a lot of Arabian no, horses. No, there were, definitely were not. No. Um, so you could have gone on the road and done, <laughs> done little uh, performances. So he inspired my book, and he, there's also a chapter, um, actually a couple chapters about him in my current book too, because he was I had him till he was 36, and uh, oh wow, yeah, That's... yeah. So he was 11 when I got him, so it was 25 years, and he was. Oh my, baby. my goodness! Oh, yeah. I can't even imagine. Yeah. It. Um, so. Did you self-publish or did you use a publisher? I uh, published through Kindle Direct. Okay. And um, so what I did um, with, well, with both books, with this one, I actually hired out, um, and I get all these connections with the American Horse Publication, so I, sure. I hired out um, the editing um, work. And the editor actually was one of my editors from a magazine that I write for. Okay. And so, and she freelance edits on the side. So she did my editing work. And uh, the book cover, I wish I brought a copy down from the trade show with me, but the book cover ended up being designed by a family friend who is a graphic artist. And it just has such a great feel. It's very inviting. And everybody that touches it is just... Um, picks it up and looks at it, just makes comments about how they would love to have a yeah, copy. Yeah, it's a beautiful cover on this little... On the picture, on yeah. Yeah, and so um, you sell it on Kindle. I do. It's, um, um, I'm fascinated by the publishing industry. has changed dramatically yes. by, because of technology. Yes. But what I love about it is that we get to uh, put anything we want to write in the hands of the people direct. Yes, but I think you do. That comes with the responsibility, too. I didn't want to put anything out there that wasn't of the highest professional quality. Absolutely. And one of the things that I I really appreciate about self-publishing is that I'm able to maintain my own intellectual property rights. I haven't sold those to anybody, you know, and I'm free. Even though I have to work a lot harder at marketing, I have a lot more freedoms than I would ever have had well, before. Well, and you're more passionate about this than probably somebody yes. just working in an yes. office in yes. New York yes. would yes. be. Yes, yes, yes. So it's, it's, the title is Always Hope. Mm -hmm. And so anybody who wants to um, look uh, the book up, um, what um, what is the sort of, is it just the story no, there's a lot of different stories in the book. Um, another reader had commented that each chapter was kind of a story in its own, okay. so it's something that you're able to kind of pick up and put down. It's not something you have to read through. Um, some of the things I talk about, my dad um, taught me AI, with artificial insemination for cattle when I was 13 from okay. the dining room table in our farmhouse. <laughs> so, uh, and then it went from there. And, and uh, So this is kind of your version of all creatures, version. all creatures yes. great and small. Yes, and we had a 
uh, farmhand almost drowned in our manure pit. And we, it's, a, it's a funny story now. It was not funny at the time. But um, there's all kinds of neat family and then farm stories as well that um, whether you have an ag background or not, you can kind of get a really good picture um, of what that, that looks like. That's excellent. Well, thank you so much. I'm definitely going to be downloading this onto, all right. my, onto my phone so I can read it. Thank you so much. So I have Parks Wells with me today. Parks, tell us a little bit about what you do now. Well, I manage the research and promotion of soybeans in the state of Tennessee for our farmers that grow in, in Tennessee. Back me all the way up to the beginning. Where did you, did you grow up? Well, I grew up in Dyer County, and we have farmland there. And went to uh, college at UT Martin and went into the Army and came back out and worked in a brokerage company in Memphis. And, and did you? what was your major? Uh, it was business. Business, okay. So you were, did you plan to get back into agriculture, or were you kind of thinking... A different route. Well, I kind of got seduced back into it in trading futures. So I was okay. in the commodity uh, futures markets for a number of years and took over a hedge account and was in the uh, buying and selling grain. Then in 91, uh, they started the national soybean checkoff and I came in then. So um, you've seen a lot of changes, obviously, in the world of agriculture. Um, what are the biggest changes that you think you've seen in the last few decades? Well, I, I guess we go from a society where we're in the field doing something with the crop, getting the weeds out, and now we're using uh, better chemicals, less pass-through in the field, and just a tremendous growth in what we use our products for. Um, Soybeans in particular are your sweet spot, as they say. Um, I, I think most people who don't know much about soybeans would be surprised by all the uses and all the places where soybeans show up. Well, we, we have a thousand uses that we know of. And uh, if you go in the grocery store and you start looking around and you start reading labels, then you'll see soy in almost everything. Something that's uh, interesting to me that I recently learned about was uh, Henry Ford's role in introducing or, or championing the soybean in the United States. I mean, I think that's a lot of people I don't think know that. Well, at one point, uh, Henry Ford wanted to have at least two bushels of soybeans in every car. <laughs> and there's a picture of him with a, a car made from soy plastic. You know, when I was at uh, DPA, we even talked about uh, the movie It's a Wonderful Life, which was on TV the other night, and they talked about soybeans and making plastic. So that was, I think, 1932 or somewhere in that time period. And it's been around for a long time, but we've gotten into using more of it for, for plastic and all kind of different products. It's just it's an amazing product. But the big usage on soybeans is a protein, the meal side, and that's what people... Uh, around the world, are, are they're not just short food, but they're short protein, and we provide the protein. And then it's also used for feed, right? And well, that's the that's fuel. the feed use is the protein side, yeah. and then of course oil is used for cooking, and then we have all the other different things that, uh, uh, like even uh, Goodyear tire and rubber are using soy in some of their production in, in the rubber uh, products. What do you think are the biggest challenges that uh, farmers today who are farming soybeans or any other row crop, what are the biggest challenges for, for ag workers? Well, it's probably trying to get the science out there that people understand the science instead of the emotion behind different things. And a lot of bad information has been circulated. And so we fight that battle of, of trying to uh, correct that information and to be sure that people understand that the things we do, we're doing for our children and grandchildren just like they are. We're the same position they are. We want a safe, affordable, abundant food supply, and that's what we have uh, with the farmers. So it's the inaccurate information. How can, we, how can we counter that? How can we get the right information out there? Well, let's look around here and we see this agriculture that DPA is doing, and that's, that's the best way is to work with the younger generation and to be sure they know more about more about the safety of food, how it's produced, and the need for food. I mean, most people, or a lot of people, think they just get food from the supermarket instead of getting it via the farm into the supermarket. Well, especially something like soybeans. You know, if you see cotton, you know a cotton bowl is cotton. A lot of people don't understand and make a connection between soy, soybean, soybean oil. And a lot of people don't see soybeans growing ever 
Right. But it's our largest crop in Tennessee as far as acreage goes. Wow. That's incredible. And, uh, it's it's not as pretty as wheat and the yellow, and it's not as pretty as the green on corn, but it's, it's a pretty leaf. But then it turns dry. We are number 16 in production among the states. So mm. we're a small state, but it's our largest crop. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. What, uh, what do you think, what does the future look like for agriculture? I think think right now uh, we're looking at a, an abundance. We're oversupplied. Mm. And so something will come along to reduce that supply or uh, production in one year is going to get kind of dry weather. Something will happen. And then we'll be back in kind of a better balance and we can get higher prices. But the low prices we have right now are, are really hurting the farmer. What, uh, what do you do here at the show? Do you, uh, are you meeting with uh, soybean farmers, or what's your role here? Well, we're meeting with all the Farm Bureau people come through and look at our booth, and we supply them with uh, Tootsie Rolls. And by the way, <laughs> Tootsie Rolls have soybeans in them. Oh, there and, you go. And uh, we also have some hand lotion made from soy that's extremely good, and we have a lot of repeat customers on that. <laughs> and we're also giving away uh, some gloves just that – have our logo on them and uh, promotion in that way but we're providing other information such as soy foods uh, guide and soybeans are in almost everything's a brochure that we've had for over 20 years and is still good and it's, it's still relevant to today yeah well fantastic well thank you for being here on our podcast today well and not only that i want to thank dpa for what they're doing in the future and uh, to be part of that is really something for us and you know, the best thing you can have is entertainment and education together. That's what we do at museums, so that's, that's, that's good. That's right. Well, well, thank you. Well, thank you for having me. Okay, so I got Jeff with me here. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. So tell me what you do. Well, I work with Honest A Block Homes, and we are a custom home manufacturer. We, we mill log homes, timber frame homes, and, and uh, the more popular hybrid homes now out of a um, out of Moss, Tennessee, which is in northern Middle Tennessee. So I'm fascinated because my my wife and I are working on uh, soon building a house. We've built one house already, so we want to build another one. Um, so I've you know I've been spending a lot of times looking at the you know home shows and and things like that. So uh, tell me a little bit about um, Honest A Belong Homes. What was the history? Where did it come from? Yeah. I mean, what it is that you guys do that's different than just a regular contractor building a house? Right. Well, we've been in business 40 years this year. We started in 1979. Wow. Our founder was uh, Doug Smith, which is uh, was a, a local person there uh, in Clay County. Grew up, his, his father saw milled some he farmed he was also a blacksmith so doug grew up around that wow um he uh he joined the army wonder what their house was like did you think they had like a really cool log log well, cabin well they actually did, did build they? a log home before okay. uh our company started but um uh doug got an engineering degree uh, and went to the army uh, when he came back home he he uh he started a mop and broom handle factory and, wow. And, you don't uh, hear of a lot of no, people who no, started mopping. What, no. wonder, wonder what made him go into that business. Well, uh, he, was, he was taking the scrap uh, from other sawmills up there and decided, you know, he could take their waste uh -huh. and make a, a, a product that he could sell. Wow. Uh, he struggled with that for a while. And like a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, he'll tell you they had a lot more failures than they had successes. Yeah. So he just rode right out of that into other things. But... A lot of wood-related um, um, products that he's produced in different companies up there, Honest Abe being one of, one of those. But uh, we pre-cut uh, log homes, meaning that we they're cut for your your door and window openings. Uh -huh. They're they're custom for each individual homeowner, um, and ship them throughout the country. We've exported, um, but most of them stay within the country. Most of them will stay within. Um, Three, four, or five hundred miles of uh, of us there in Moss, Tennessee, but we do we do ship out west pretty frequently out to Colorado. And so and you guys like you you put the you cut the wood, you know, to spec. Yes, I guess, and then you ship it, and then somebody has a contractor already lined up, or you have yes. one that you fix so, them up with. So we have four direct sales models in Tennessee, and then we have a dealer network that's 
somewhat nationwide. And a lot of those dealers then, for them to be successful, they have to be able to get these homes built. So okay. some of them are builders, some are contractors, some are just networked with, with people that, that do that. So, yes, it's sent to them. It's almost a paint-by-number type okay. erection um, the, to, to erect the log home. And, and so that, that's, that's basically it. We do from uh, very the most basic cabins to uh, some of the most uh, extravagant designs and, and um, homes that you'll, you'll see. So anything, anything goes. Pretty much it's all up to the customer. And how long have you been working for them? Uh, for 20 years. Wow, yeah. 20 so, years. So what was your background? Uh, I've got an ag business degree. Grew oh. up on a small uh, burly tobacco um, beef cattle uh, farm in what? In, in Clay County. Okay. I, I grew up about five miles from Moss, Tennessee. Okay. Um, got got an agriculture degree. I was actually farming uh, when I ended up going to work for Honest Abe. Uh, me and my wife were customers of Honest Abe. Oh, so you had, they built your house? Yes. Same right. house you're in now? Yes. Yes. And, and it's uh, uh, what is it like a traditional kind of log cabin it, it, or it's it's more traditional uh, design, more of a Cape Cod type type thing, about twenty two hundred square feet, sitting on a basement. So uh, yeah, we're I live five miles from the plant. And so you got them. So so you, they built your house, your cabin. Sorry. Yes. And then and then you just liked it so much, you said, you know what, I'm going to let other people know about this. Had, had a rough year farming, and, and I knew the president of the company at that time, and he had talked to me off and on for two or three years about going to work uh, for him, and, and finally I did, and um, it, it, was, it was a very good very good move. It's And if, if people wanted to find out more about Honest Abe Log Homes, where should they go? HonestAbe.com, and uh, we have events throughout the year. Um which we've got a website that's full of uh, lots of pretty pictures, uh, designs, floor plans, which uh, everybody likes to see those. Yeah. Um, but we also have events through the year. We just had a tour of homes uh, yesterday out of Crossville, Tennessee. Um, we have uh, log raising uh, seminars, demonstrations there. The next one being in January, January 25th. I think there should be like an HGTV like reality show on this, on different log homes. Wouldn't that be a good idea? That'd be a good idea. Very good idea. If you're out there yeah. listening <laughs> and you've got connections, let them know. This is the guy to talk to. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you so much for coming here today. We really appreciate Thanks, it. Scott. It's fascinating. I saw, I saw you guys over there, and I was like, oh, man, i got to get yeah. them over here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And I have Phyllis here with me. Phyllis, tell me a little bit about what you do in agriculture. Oh, thank you all. Thanks so much for being a part of our Farm Bureau annual meeting and convention. Uh, in Tennessee Pork Producers, I've had the great opportunity to work with that association for 18 years. Wow. And it is a wonderful group of farmers, ag industry professionals, all of those folks who are interested in, concerned about, and are involved some way, somehow, in the production of pork for all of us. Fantastic. So let's back up a little bit. Where did Phyllis come from? I had the opportunity. Uh, my first job out of college was being a 4-H agent in, at that time, a major hog producing county in our state, Franklin County. Now, had you grown up in agriculture from yes, the very beginning? Yes, I am from a beef and tobacco background. Oh. have my degrees from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, in ag economics and ag education. And uh, it was just a nice fit after being a 4-H agent for a while. The opportunity came open to uh, go into association management. So it was a great way to try something a little bit different, but yet still working with the farm folks and a major part of what we do uh, in agriculture promotion uh, associations is uh, we promote uh, the educational awareness, the opportunities that our farmers can, you know, take advantage of with our national associations, as well as doing those consumer promotions all across the state. And that's what's fun because we are working with our agriculture, uh, our our industry professionals as well as our farmers and you know that's that's a great opportunity i think a lot of people don't understand all the jobs that are available in agriculture like like yours are you still do you still farm 
Uh, I guess you could say we have a, a part-time uh, farm operation. My husband and I both work off the farm. Our daughter enjoys agriculture. She shows beef cattle. Oh. And and also what's great about Tennessee agriculture is we all work together. As you've seen here today, mm-hmm. you know, all of our commodity groups, we depend on each other. We work great with each other. So we farm part-time. I do not have pigs on the farm, but we do have uh, beef cattle, and it is more of a hobby. But uh, it's also the, the hours involved, and, you know, we know what our farmers are, are doing. So you've seen a lot of changes in the years that you've been working in agriculture. What do you think are the biggest changes that that come to your mind when you think about innovation? Obviously with pork production, and it's fun to talk to the farmers that I work with and, you know, hear what they have to say, why they've done what they have done. Uh, I know now folks enjoy uh, knowing their farmer, the local pork production, and that's, you know, that's great. We have pork producers, especially in Middle Tennessee, that are more traditional, more in West Tennessee. They've done the little uh, bit of uh, change and have more of our um, uh, animals raised indoors, and that way our farmers can really take care of their livestock. They are looking after their animals, making sure that the predators, you know, are, are not a nuisance, right. and it can also monitor those animals very carefully, make sure that the temperature stays consistent, and make sure that their feed requirements are met. So that's been the, the biggest innovation uh, in Tennessee. We have gone more along the lines of like when we think of those Midwestern states like Iowa, Indiana, Illinois, how they produce hogs. We have that now, too. Mm -hmm. Well, I know like Tosh Farms Mm -hmm. uh, is doing some incredible things with with science and and the application of technology and just the way they take care of people, people who are not in the agriculture world and who do not farm for a living have no idea some of the things that are going on uh, in agriculture. Can you just... Uh, share a little bit about that aspect of farming and what's going on. And I think that's something that those of us in agriculture have probably finally realized that with so few folks involved in the production of the food for all of us, we better make sure and share with the world what we're doing because um, misinformation, that's how that gets out there. So folks like Tosh Farms, uh, other operations there in West Tennessee, the grain farmers that you work with, it's so great to know that like drone technology is now in place that people can keep watch on uh, their uh, crops that are growing and, and, you know, take care of what needs to be done in a timely manner and just the efficiency of agriculture. And, And that's what is great. Agriculture is an efficient industry. That's why we don't have as many people that are needed to actually produce the food for all of us, but we have so many people in the world to feed, and it's wonderful that we have Discovery Park taking care of the message of showing what agriculture really is. Yeah, we're really excited, and, and we, we've all learned a lot working you know, on this exhibit on innovation and agriculture. What tools do you think are the most important in your toolbox? I think that willingness to talk to the consumer, so that's why I look forward to what Discovery Park is doing And, you know, yes, it's going to be visual, but there's also going to be the voices and the faces. And I've I've enjoyed seeing, like, the different faces that you all are already putting to the exhibit. And that's just the way to share the message, even though we can communicate so much, so many ways, social media, everybody wants to know what's going on now. A good conversation goes a long way. Yeah, social media is both a blessing and a curse, just like you can use it to honestly communicate what's going on. Someone else can use it for nefarious reasons mm-hmm. to miscommunicate mm-hmm. because they have their own agendas. I think that's probably the, one of the biggest challenges of every industry. What, uh, what do you think is the future? What does the future look like for agriculture? Future and Ag, so many opportunities. Um, As a mom of a 16-year-old daughter uh, who has an interest in agriculture, it's a lot of fun to kind of explore areas with her what to look into. The environmental uh, areas, the aspects of what we are doing to keep that soil health uh, in livestock production, genetics, and just the tools that can be used to, you know, think about how we can produce that high quality, best protein that we have in the U.S., but we still want to keep, you know, making it the be- make the best better and be able to feed the world. I think that's probably one of the misunderstandings of people when they think about agriculture. They, they don't know all the STEM principles that are applied, all the science, all, all the skills that farmers are today are applying to agriculture. You know, I mean, it is a whole different world from what it was 30, 40 years ago. 
Exactly, and we are fortunate. Our um, extension, um, University of Tennessee, Institute of Agriculture, campuses at Martin, campuses at Knoxville, Chattanooga, all around the state, you know, that do the research. And research is important because that takes us from where we are to where we can be. It's uh, been fun here today talking to everybody about innovation and, and, and for us it's been really educational and helpful. What do you come here for? What do you get out of coming to this show? A friend of mine shared this with me a few years ago. When you come to the Farm Bureau Convention, you have a chance to visit all across the state. So one afternoon, I can visit with folks. I just finished talking to a gentleman from Knox County, and they have a really successful farm day in the spring where they educate young people about uh, many areas of agriculture. So for me, that's the way I can connect with him and go, oh, yeah, let's get those educational resources to you for that activity. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, I'm talking to someone from Dyer County on, you know, a different project. But this is where you meet and uh, get to work with in one afternoon, through this conference, people from all across the state who have that common agriculture interest. Well, thank you so much for sharing with us, and thank you for the work you've been doing with us on the exhibit. Thank you. So I'm really excited to have Gail here. Tell me a little bit about you. I know that, I know that you have made my day even brighter because I ate some of your chocolate gravy. So tell us a little bit about that. We started Grandma's Old Fashioned Chocolate Gravy when my oldest daughter was pretty young. It started as a hobby and all her friends and family would come over and they wanted me to make the chocolate gravy and as we progressed everybody wanted us to make it and sell it to them. Uh, as the years progressed on we ended up deciding to make it as a business. We started out making it in the mason jars. And so the recipe, did it, it comes from your grandmother or have you adapted it? We kind of adapted it. Okay. I took uh, a mixture between both my grandparents and my mom. Because it seems like chocolate gravy um, would be have the risk of being too sweet. Yes. But it's the, I've sampled it. It was just it's the smooth. right. It was just the right amount. So your family had a ball testing it. I'm sure all the different uh, through yeah. the years. Yes. So, um, and when we redesigned this new package, we took about six months taste testing, okay. and we took several different people and we tried and tried until we got the right taste so no it, it took us back people to up north year? they have uh -huh. no idea what it is right. why don't you explain a little bit about what chocolate like. gravy is chocolate gravy is a true southern tradition it is served traditionally over biscuits um a lot of people do it over pancakes waffles it can be served over ice cream angel food cake um, my children eat it over uh ice cream it can be served as pudding. I've known people that eat it over scrambled eggs. And it's kind of like, what do you suppose, what is the difference between chocolate sauce and chocolate gravy? The thickness of it? The thickness, because the chocolate gravy is thicker. Chocolate sauce is more like what you would put in chocolate milk. Because it's not like melted. It's not just melted chocolate. No, it is thickened yeah. because it is a root. It starts with the root Yeah. because it has a fat in it. But it is nowhere near like a white gravy that you put cocoa in. Okay. You have to get past that yep. mentality. And that's what most people, when they hear chocolate gravy, they're thinking you've got a savory and yeah. you're adding cocoa to it. Yeah. It's not. It is a sweet, mm -hmm. but it's not overly sweet. And so you guys, so you, you knew you'd hit upon something. Um, there's a lot of people out there that cook and bake and, you know, want to want to make... They, a lot of people want to do what you did. So what... Um, what was the next step in your process? What made you think you were going to be successful at doing this? Truthfully, mm -hmm. the good Lord put it in my mind. Okay. So the Lord put it in your mind that you should go down this. Yes. You should pursue this. And you did. Now, what have been some of the challenges along the way? Every time I've hit a hurdle, um, he's opened another door for me. And what, Tell me some of the hurdles. What kind of hurdles? <laughs> Like I was telling you, we started out making these in mason jars. Okay. And we went to an event in Jackson, the Bunny Run, mm -hmm. and <laughs> we opened up the hatchback of the car, and I had cases upon cases of glass mason jars fall out. Oh. And we had broken glass and cocoa all over the place. Oh, my goodness. And at that point in time, we had to decide, was this going to be a hobby or was it going to be a business? Mm -hmm. So we shut the business down for about a year. Okay. 
and sat down and we designed our new packaging, which I'm very proud of. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's the packaging that I'm, we are using right now. On the bottom of it, we do have a little cartoon that has my two daughters and my grandbaby on it. It's okay. going to Grandma's house that I'm and, proud of. And what is the name of the of what is the name of your company? Grandma's Old Fashioned Chocolate Gravy Mix. Okay, and so if somebody Googles that, will they be able to find it online so they can see what it looks like? Yes, they can go to www.grandmasoldfashioned.com. Okay, and that'll show you what the packaging looks like so yes. they'll know. And can they order it online as they well? They can go online okay. and order it. We also have a Facebook page. Um, another thing that I am proud of, and I am very strict about it, I do have John 316 on the back of, on the back of my package okay. because I do believe this is something that he has led me. Every time that we've come across a hurdle, he's all, always opened the door for us. And it's a it's a uh, it's a powder now. Yes. So it it's is not a, mix. a powder. Is that a mix? Thank you. It That's is a the mix. right word. And it's uh, you can mix it with milk or water, either one. Uh, for those that are lactose intolerant, it is better with milk. It's going to be a creamier. Uh-huh. Um, it's very simple. A lot of people that know how to make it still say it's a lot easier to make it with the mix. Uh-huh. We have been in all the food giants, and we have been in several stores. Fantastic. Um, and in the process right now, we are strictly right now, strictly online, and that is a personal preference for me right now due to the fact that I am taking care of an elderly uh-huh. family member that's had some health issues. Yep, but... But it's a, it's a great uh, motivational testimony to somebody who is out there with a good idea like yours and wants to push through and see it come to reality. Uh, you're here. What's your what's the response been to your chocolate gravy here today? Awesome. Is this your first time to come to this show? Yes, sir. And what how how's it been? Uh, positive. People are people are loving it. Yes. There was a big line there when I was trying to get some while ago. I noticed a very big line, and even everybody that says I don't like chocolate gravy because I've never tried it, mm-hmm. I'll say just try it. Right, I'd never tried it. Right, I thought it was delicious, and it's surprising. That's the re- yeah. reaction we get. Is yeah, because people get the idea in their mind they're not going to like it because they have this mentality that nah. But once they try it, yeah. if they like chocolate, yeah, chances are they're going to like it. Well, congratulations on making a dream a reality. A lot of people have dreams and never actually make it happen. So you're making it happen. So congratulations for that. Thank you very much. And I look forward to seeing it in in all over the place. And I'm going to get online and order some. Thank you very much. You're welcome. (laughs) Bye-bye. Bye-bye. And I'm here with Debbie Joins. Debbie, welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about what you do in the agriculture world. So... um, what I do right now is I'm president of the Tennessee Sheep Producers Association. And, and basically what that is, we're a group of shepherds across the state who try to promote our product, and that is sheep, okay. whether it be meat or wool. Okay. Uh, and the Sheep Producers Association is a, a group. We've got about 75 members, and, and we meet annually and, and get in speakers about our, uh, that help us raise our sheep. That's fascinating. So before we talk any more about sheep, let's go back to talk about you, um, where you came from, or where did you grow up on a, on a, in an agricultural environment? Well, the funny thing is I was born in Miami. Can't oh. you tell by my accent? <laughs> so, I, um, I, but, but I got to Tennessee as fast as I could, and, <laughs> uh, and I picked up the southern accent, of course. But um, historically, I've, I've lived on a uh, beef, or, and we've actually milked dairy cows before um, and had horses, so I've always lived on a, a farm. But uh, most recently, I retired from the University of Tennessee, okay. and as that retirement project, I wanted to get into some sort of small livestock that I could manage. Mm-hmm. And so about five years ago, I bought my first five ewes, uh, and and that's the rest of the story. I've started raising sheep as a as a pro, as, as a basically a project uh, for me to do during my retirement. Now, what were you doing um, at the university? My my background is soil science. Okay. So I managed a laboratory, the Soil Plant and Pest Center in Nashville. Okay. Uh, and and we did soil analysis and forage testing for farmers. So that was a great. Great career. Farmers are my favorite kind of people, and uh, I do miss working with them, but I still get to work with them as well as with what I do now. Now, you know, it's funny. You don't think of uh, sheep in Tennessee as much as you do 
other places, you mm-hmm. know, other countries, Scotland, for mm-hmm. example. Right. Um, is have there always been sheep, or is there an increase in sheep farmers and shepherds? Uh, that's a good question because most recently in our county, we had um, the year of the wool at the Wilson County Fair. We had many people, farmers, who came by and said, you know, we used to have sheep. I didn't realize this, but 50 years ago, everybody had sheep. Hmm. Uh, the reason so many people don't now is because of mainly because of predation. So the coyotes have really given sheep a hard time. Okay. Uh, so most of us have to have dogs, but uh, our guardian dogs with our sheep. And and but the numbers are increasing. We think because mainly a lot, of, and you've seen this, a lot of the larger farms are being cut up to five-acre farmettes. Uh, and you can still put a lot of sheep. You can put seven or eight sheep on an acre of ground and, and be fairly successful with that. So, And so what what is the, uh, is there anything that stands out in, is it sheep farming or shepherding? I don't know the right <laughs> word to use. In a, well, we, we call ourselves shepherds. Shepherds, yeah. I love that. And the sheep are flocks. Okay. And and most of us like like my flock I've had is I started out with five. Okay. I got up to sixty five. Wow. And then went back down to about ten. Okay. And now I'm back up to about thirty. Okay. Um, I don't really know. I can't honestly say what the average size flock mm-hmm. is in Tennessee, wow. but I know of some three hundred plus wow. uh, shepherds, uh, and I know of some that just keep less than ten. Yeah. Um, the, the thing about sheep is is the breeds themselves have, have kind of evolved. Back in the 50s, uh, sheep were mainly raised for wool and, and then meat. Mm-hmm. Well, nowadays we have hair sheep um, that have gotten really popular. That's what flavor I have. Okay. They're Katahdin uh, sheep uh, that were developed. The breed was developed by a fella in Katahdin, Maine. Uh-huh. And these sheep shed. Okay. So they don't have to be sheared. Oh, what, how do you get there? Do you just pick it up off the ground. Well, or, <laughs> what that? Yeah, and what they do, and you'll find it in a lot of bird nests too. It's pretty mm-hmm. cool. Mm-hmm. But what they do is they'll rub their their uh, wool, and it's really short. They'll mm-hmm. rub it up against the fence. Okay. To try to get it off every year. Yeah. And they'll shed all their wool, and it's a really short, thick uh, fleece. Uh, they'll shed it. In, in the spring and then in the in the fall they'll grow it back as and the then, weather and gets then cold. you pick it all up and then what do you do with it well actually I don't do anything with it but um, there are people that actually have made a little enterprise with that they'll uh, uh, put it in uh, balls and sell it okay uh, in little twine balls and sell that uh, at farmers markets and whatever I haven't done that yeah. yet you know you never know if that'll happen or not but but at any rate, that's there's really not much of a market for for that uh, on hair sheep. What um what 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 is different about farming sheep and than farming cattle and other you know what what are the that, unique challenges that that you have as a shepherd? That's a good question. So I, I would think the biggest challenge is predators. Number mm. one, sheep are not the smartest animal. But it's not really their fault. Uh, probably their only defense is they stamp their feet. Okay. You know, if a dog or something comes by, they'll stomp their feet like that's supposed to scare you off, yeah. right? But um, so we have to have guardian dogs with them. I have had coyotes uh, kill a couple of my lambs before oh, that wow. I unfortunately I didn't have with my lambs. Uh-huh. Uh, the dogs weren't with them, but. Uh-huh. Um, that's probably the hardest part is is, is dealing with and that. Many, what kind of dogs do you have? I have what's called Anatolian Shepherds and Akbosh. So it's they're a crossbreed. They're about 125 pounds. They're a tall dog, about waist high. Mm-hmm. Um, they look like a Labrador with a black mask. Okay, and, and is is it like a? Is, it's a working dog, obviously. Yes, they but, stay with the sheep 24-7. So, so, so they're not your pet. You don't take them in the house. And, no. You know, they're I working don't, dogs. I, and, and I try. I do pet them occasionally, but uh, their names are Larry and Mo. Uh, they're, they're <laughs> do you siblings. have a Curly? Is Curly no, on his way? No, <laughs> I haven't gotten a Curly yet, but uh, I'm sure if I ever get another one, I'll, its name will be Curly. 
Uh, but but they stay with the sheep. That's all they know. Yeah. Uh, they would prefer to be with the sheep, yeah. actually. Yeah. Well, that's so interesting. Yeah. Um, do you have? Do you, do you like put pictures on Instagram or anything of these? I do. Do you I, use social media? Yes, I do. You're, I have Indigo Valley Farm on Facebook. Now I don't have it on Instagram. Okay. Yet, but on I Facebook, have. you're Indigo Valley Farm. Yes. Okay. Great. So anybody who's interested in sheep can Absolutely. can like you, and they'll see all all kinds of cool posts. Yeah. Yeah. I've got some. Uh, uh, Pictures of grandkids with lambs and that sort of thing. I, I really enjoy enjoy my flock. They're, well, my wife very... told me she wants us to buy a miniature sheep. Have oh, you ever heard of that? I, I have. Yeah. I've seen smaller ones like yeah, that. She yeah, she wants to get a mini, but I don't think I don't think that's in our future. Yeah, I don't. I don't soon. think they come in the hair sheep variety. So yeah. if you got one, you'd have to learn to shear it. That's Uh-oh. a job. Yeah, no, we don't want to have to do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for being here today. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate it. Appreciate it, Scott. Bye bye. Thank you for listening to Real Foot Forward. If you enjoyed this podcast, please be sure to subscribe, rate, and leave a review on iTunes or wherever you may be listening. Plan your own adventure to see beyond at Discovery Park of America by visiting discoveryparkofamerica.com. Be sure to also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter for the latest updates.